Hello, and welcome to your second generative models lecture. In the last lecture, one of the things that we talked about was the two major forms of generative modeling. The first one, which we covered last time, is density estimation. These are models that explicitly learn a density function, like in naive Bayes, Gaussian mixture models, or variational autoencoders, that we then sample from in order to generate new inputs. And while we focused on that last time, we also mentioned that there was a different type of generative modeling that's common, sample generation. Sample generation models still aim to generate new values, new images that look like the original input, but instead of doing this through explicit density estimation, rather we take training data and we train some type of generator in order to create new samples. We reward this generator when it creates things that look like our training data, and we punish it when it doesn't. So let's talk about one of the most common types of sample generation models, the Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN. One of the most important concepts behind a GAN is this adversarial part. A GAN is really two models in a trench coat fighting it out with each other. We can think about what a GAN does through analogy. In a GAN, the generator is basically like a counterfeiter. The generator's job is to create new inputs that look like the original inputs. This is like a counterfeiter trying to generate new fake bills that look like real currency. And the generator is battling it out with the discriminator. The discriminator's job is to look at both real and counterfeit examples and learn how to discriminate between the two. In other words, the discriminator is like a cashier or a cop whose job it is to figure out when the generator has provided a fake example versus when something is real. We call this adversarial training because the generator's job is to try and trick our discriminator by creating samples that look as close as possible to the original input. But this isn't the only way that people use adversarial training. For instance, in our convolutional neural net lecture, we talked a little bit about adversarial training where we take specific batches of noise that are created specifically to trick our network into classifying images that to us look like a panda as something else, like in this case, a gibbon. Just like in a GAN, we are here trying to deliberately trick our model in order to help it learn to discriminate better. And many people have hypothesized that we could use these GPT detectors as adversarial training for further iterations of GPT models. For instance, if someone is training GPT-4 or 5, they might want to use some of the most common detectors and train their models in order to trick these detectors. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the architecture of these two models, the generator and the discriminator. The discriminator part of the model is pretty straightforward. We actually build discriminator models all the time, like a logistic regression. All this model does is it takes in some input, maybe some tabular data, maybe an image, and it tries to classify the input as either fake or real. So the discriminator is doing a very simple binary classification task. The discriminator is gonna take in batches of data, usually half of which that are real samples from our training data, and then half of which are fake samples, which are created with our generator. When the discriminator is training, it's just trying to classify real samples as real and fake samples as fake. And that's what its loss function depends on. Can it accurately classify real samples as real and fake ones as fake? The generator is a bit more complicated. The generator is trying to create fake examples, but the only way we can tell if it's done that successfully is if it can trick the discriminator into thinking that fake samples are real. The generator creates fake images by taking in random noise, usually this is from a uniform distribution, inputting it into the generator, and then outputting something that looks like a fake example. At first, the generator is going to be pretty bad, and its examples would be very easily distinguishable from real samples. But that feedback is crucial to the generator because as the discriminator decides which is real and which is fake, we use that information to train the generator into producing better output. So again, the generator takes in some random noise and it's trying to learn some function that can take that noise 
and turn it into something that looks like a real example from our training data. The way it learns is by getting information or feedback from the discriminator based on what can trick the discriminator or not. Because our GAN is basically two neural networks in a trench coat, we're going to train each part separately. Typically what we're going to do is we're going to train the discriminator holding the generator constant. So while the generator is creating its fake inputs, we are then going to use those to train our discriminator, updating the weights of the discriminator only. Then once we've trained the discriminator, we are going to train the generator holding the discriminator constant. And then we repeat these steps until hopefully our GAN converges and is generating pretty realistic images. People often talk about GANs as kind of a zero-sum game where both the generator and the discriminator are trying to win. And what are they trying to win? Well, let's talk a little bit about the loss function we use for a GAN. The original GAN loss function that was proposed looks like this. Basically, it consists of two components. Let's look at the left-hand side first. We're going to look at this term D of X. D of X tells us that when we put a real sample, referred to as X, into our discriminator, we're going to get out a predicted probability that that sample is real. Now, because we specified that x is a real sample from our data set, we want this value to be very high. In other words, we want our discriminator to be fairly confident that this real sample actually is real. Then we take the log of that value and the expectation over all possible samples in our training data. Basically, this term refers to the expected value of a discriminator's output when the sample is real. If our discriminator is doing a really good job, d of x should be very high. In other words, there's a high predicted probability that the sample is indeed real. When our predicted probability is real, so will the log of that predicted probability, and therefore the overall expectation for all samples should also be high if the discriminator is consistently good at detecting that real samples are real. On the right-hand side of this loss function, we have another output, d of g of z. The z here represents that random noise that we feed into the generator, and g of z is what happens when we put that noise through the generator. Basically, it's our fake output that the generator is creating. Just like before, d of g of z refers to the discriminator's estimate that a fake sample is real. Just like before, d refers to the discriminator's output. So d of g of z is basically saying when we take noise, put it through a generator, and then feed that output to the discriminator, what is the discriminator's predicted probability that that sample is real? Now, remember, when we take some noise Z and put it through our generator G, we are creating a fake example. So if the discriminator is working well, D of G of Z should be very low because the discriminator will go, that is very unlikely to be a real sample. Thus, for a well-performing discriminator, this entire term here should be very small. And when we take one minus a very small number, we'll get something very close to one. Thus, when the discriminator is performing well, this portion of the loss function should also be high. Like before, we're going to take the log of this value and the expectation over all possible fake samples. If the discriminator is consistently good, then across all possible fake examples that we have, this d of g of z should be very small, and thus this side of the equation should be quite large. Now, remember, our GAN is really two separate neural networks battling it out. So as we look at this function, you can tell that the discriminator wants to maximize this function. Remember, a well-performing discriminator will have a high value for the estimate that real samples are real and a low estimate for fake samples being real. If you plug in those values, you'll notice that that maximizes this loss function. But the discriminator is battling it out with the generator. The generator would like to minimize this loss function. Now, the generator really has no control over how the discriminator classifies real samples, so this part of the loss function doesn't really matter to our generator. Rather, we focus on this side. We can change the parameters of the generator in order to create samples the discriminator is unsure about or maybe even thinks are real. Thus, if we have a good generator, this d of g of z is actually going to be quite high. In other words, if our generator is good at creating fake examples, the discriminator is going to be confused and think that those examples are real. 
Thus, this value will be high and this overall value will be low. So now that we know a little bit about the original gain loss function, let's talk about how we optimize it. Here's some pseudocode looking at how the training process for a GAN might work. First, we have a for loop. This is going to repeat once for each iteration or update to our network. The first step is to train the discriminator. To do this, we're going to hold the generator constant. So we're not going to be updating any weights in the generator at this point only in the discriminator. And while we don't have to do this, it is traditional that we might update the discriminator a couple of times in each iteration. That's what this second for loop is doing. For each of these steps, we're gonna generate a batch of real data by just sampling from our training data and a sample of fake data. We're gonna do this by putting random noise into our generator and asking for fake samples. We're then gonna take these real and fake samples and use gradient ascent, because remember we're trying to maximize the loss function at this point, in order to update our discriminator's parameters. Once we've updated the discriminator parameters, we then move on to the generator. To train the generator, we are going to hold our discriminator constant. This means we're gonna use all of the parameter updates we made here, but we're not actually updating the discriminator in this part. In order to train the generator, we're gonna generate a bunch of fake samples, and then we're gonna send those samples through the discriminator and see what the predicted probabilities are. Using these predicted probabilities, we're gonna use gradient descent, because of course we would like to minimize our loss function for the generator, to adjust the generator parameters. Remember in this step, we're not touching the discriminator. All we're doing is updating the generator parameters. We then repeat these steps, holding generator constant, updating discriminator, holding discriminator constant, updating generator, over and over until hopefully our GAN converges. However, in practice, training GANs can be very difficult, and this is an open problem that people are still working on. So let's talk about some of the things that can go wrong when training a GAN. The first thing that can happen is actually basically too much of a good thing. What if the discriminator in our model is just too good? One common problem is that the discriminator in our GAN is too good at predicting that fake images are fake with really high confidence. You can think of an analogy here. It's easier to recognize a Van Gogh painting than it would be to generate a Van Gogh painting for yourself. Thus, the discriminator often has an easier task than the generator. In one of his papers about GANs, the creator, Ian Goodfellow, says this. In the Minimax game, this is where we're having the generator and the discriminator compete. The discriminator minimizes a cross-entropy function, but the generator maximizes that same cross-entropy. This is unfortunate for the generator because if the discriminator successfully rejects generator samples with high confidence, the generator's gradient vanishes. Basically, this means that if the discriminator is too good at telling whether generator samples are fake, then the generator can't really learn how it might be able to trick the discriminator. We can see what this looks like using this image from Ian Goodfellow's paper. On the y-axis, we have the predicted probability of a fake sample created by the generator of being real. Remember, a successful discriminator will be able to tell that this image is fake and therefore have a very low predicted probability that a fake image is real. That would be represented sort of in this region of the x-axis. A poor discriminator would not be able to tell that this fake image is real. Therefore, we would be more in this region of the graph. On the y-axis, we have the loss function of the generator. Remember that we've talked about in gradient descent that if our gradient or our learning rate are zero, then we can't actually make updates to any of our parameters, and therefore our model can't actually learn anything. This graph shows us that when the discriminator is really good, aka when we're in this region of the graph, that the gradient is going to go to zero or near zero. When this gradient is zero or near zero, this means that we can't actually make updates to our generator, and therefore our generator is unable to learn how to generate realistic looking samples. Again, what this graph shows us is that when our discriminator is too good, aka it's rejecting generator samples by predicting very confidently that fake samples are fake, then our generator is not really able to learn how to generate effective samples that can trick the discriminator. This is because when our discriminator is too good, the gradient of our generator loss function is zero or near zero. 
One modification that's been suggested in order to help fix this is by switching the way that the generator is measuring success. In the original GAN loss function, the generator is trying to minimize the probability of an image being classified as fake. But we can reframe that as the generator wanting to maximize the probability that the image is real. This helps make updates to the generator be more stable so that the generator can still learn how to trick the discriminator. Another common issue that GANs can face when training is something called mode collapse. Mode collapse is when the generator just creates the same sample over and over or a few of similar samples over and over instead of generating a broad range of realistic inputs. You can see this happening visually in this MNIST dataset where we're generating values that look like digits. In these top images, you can see that there isn't any mode collapse. We are seeing a wide variety of different digits being produced by our model. On the bottom, however, you do see mode collapse. Basically, this happens because the generator learns that there is an optimal example that can trick the discriminator into thinking that fake output is real. So instead of learning a wide variety of things, the generator just keeps creating the same exact fake example, no matter what you input into the generator. This is a problem because we want our generator to be able to create a wide variety of samples that look like all of the different samples that we had in our training data. We don't just want it to keep creating the same fake image over and over. And this is an open problem in GAN training. So if you ever are training a GAN, it's really important to make sure you're checking to see if mode collapse is happening. Last but not least, GANs also have a problem with convergence. Remember that unlike other neural networks, GANs are two neural networks that are really battling it out and that have opposing goals. The discriminator's job is to be able to tell really accurately whether samples are fake, or real. And the generator's job is to trick the discriminator by creating samples that are so close to the real examples that the discriminator can't tell the difference. Last but not least, a problem that GANs face when training is a lack of convergence. Remember, unlike most models that we've talked about, GANs are two separate models that have opposing purposes that are being trained together. While sometimes these two things training in tandem will be able to reach some type of equilibrium, oftentimes they won't be able to. As Ian Goodfellow says in his paper on GAN, sometimes the two players, the generator and the discriminator, will eventually reach an equilibrium, but in other scenarios, they just repeatedly undo each other's progress without actually learning anything useful. So it sounds like GANs have a lot of problems when it comes to training, and we already talked about one potential solution using a non-saturating GAN loss. However, there's other proposed solutions that people are commonly using now. One of those is the Wasserstein GAN. The Wasserstein GAN, or W GAN, changes the loss function of the GAN entirely. In a typical GAN, our discriminator is predicting a probability, a value between 0 and 1, that indicates how likely it is that an item is fake or real. Thus, the discriminator's output is strictly bounded between 0 and 1, and we could use, for example, 50% as a threshold to classify things as real versus fake. In a Wasserstein GAN, the discriminator doesn't generate a probability that something's real, rather it generates more of a continuous score that's not bounded between 0 and 1. The goal of a Wasserstein GAN when you're training is for the discriminator to maximize this value. This means that our Wasserstein GAN would like for the discriminator to output higher values for real samples than for fake samples. When the discriminator's output is higher for real samples, this number will be very high, and this number will be very small. Thus, when we take a hopefully big number and subtract a small number, we should get an overall large number. The generator, on the other hand, wants to maximize the discriminator's output for a fake sample. Thus, the generator maximizes this function, 
Because a Wasserstein GANS discriminator doesn't output a probability, but rather just a score, we often refer to it not as a discriminator, but as a critic. The critic scores real and fake items, and a good critic will have higher scores for real items and lower scores for fake items. Using the Wasserstein GAN can help address two of the problems we just talked about, the saturating GAN loss as well as the mode collapse. There's a few other changes that Wasserstein GANs make in comparison to the original original GAN architecture, which we won't go over here. But what's important to remember is that because of some of the issues that we were talking about previously, a Wasserstein GAN has a critic instead of a discriminator. Instead of generating a probability that something is real, the Wasserstein GAN critic will create a score, and the goal is that real samples will have a higher score than fake samples. The generator, of course, wants the opposite. It wants to have as high of scores as possible for fake samples. Lastly, let's talk about one other modification that we can make to GANs, not necessarily to improve some of the issues with the loss that we're talking about, but in order to make our GANs a little bit more useful. A conditional GAN is a simple GAN architecture that takes in an extra input into both the discriminator and the generator. Let's think of the MNIST dataset that has a bunch of different digit images. Those digit images actually have class values, right? We have a class of zeros, of ones, of twos, of threes, etc. for each of our digits. We can feed that class information into both our generator and discriminator in order to help us learn how to generate items from a specific class. So instead of telling the generator, give me a digit, we could tell the generator, give me a one specifically. Our hope is that our generator is going to learn how to produce samples that involve information about the class. A conditional GAN has a very similar architecture to a typical GAN, but the discriminator and the generator will just both have an additional input, which is usually something like a one hot encoded vector indicating what group a specific sample is from. For instance, here, if we were using digits, we would feed in which digit this item is. We'd feed that into the generator along with random noise in order to generate a fake sample. We'd also feed that into the discriminator in order to allow the discriminator to decide whether or not that image is fake or real, given that it's a one. To review, today we talked about generative adversarial networks. This is an example of generative models that are doing sample generation, contrasted to density estimation, which we covered with variational autoencoders. Generative adversarial networks, or GANs, are basically two neural networks in a trench coat that are playing a game against each other. A GAN has two main components, the generator, whose job it is to create fake inputs, and a discriminator, whose job it is to tell whether something is real or fake. The real data in the discriminator comes from our actual training data. So for instance, images of animals or foods. The fake samples come from the generator and they're created by feeding random noise into the generator and asking the generator to turn that in to a fake example. The generator's goal is to trick the discriminator into thinking that its fake output is real. The discriminator's goal is to be able to easily tell the difference between fake and real samples. These two parts of the GAN battle it out and an ideal situation will converge so that our generator is creating items that are so similar to the original training data that the discriminator can't tell the difference. However, we also talked about some issues that GANs have when training, namely the vanishing gradient for the generator, mode collapse, and lastly, a lack of convergence. While these are still pretty open problems, we did talk about a few solutions to some of them. First of all, we can use a non-saturating GAN loss that helps us make sure that the gradient of the generator is not vanishing. And we can also switch to a Wasserstein GAN or W GAN. Instead of the discriminator outputting a predicted probability, the Wasserstein critic outputs a continuous score. The goal of the discriminator is to always have higher scores for real samples, and the goal of the generator is to have as high a score as possible for fake examples. Lastly, we talked about conditional GANs, which feed in additional information in order to have a model that can generate items from a specific class. For instance, we could train a GAN on various animals and ask it specifically to create a fake cat for us. All right, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time.